Hey, D, do me a favor. Diego, do me a favor on the way back. Can you close that kitchen door, please? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good to see all of you. Go ahead and get situated the way you want. I know that we don't have tables or desks in here, but if you would like to just turn a chair around so that you can write, that's up to you, because um, uh, from this point on, we're going to be, um, from today on, we're going to be really getting heavily into these principles, okay? So uh, really looking forward to this. How's everybody doing? Good? Fantastic. That's good. Good word. Fantastic. Isn't that like a cleaner for countertops and stuff too? Fantastic. Yeah. Corn. Oh, there you go. All right. How's everybody doing? Um, tonight, we're going to pick up for the first time, in it, although we've referenced them in the past, in a number of ways, we're going to start diving right into the, the, the heart of our study, um, which we basically started back in January, um, the principles of Bible study. Um, so if you don't have a copy of our little How to Study the Bible booklet, go ahead and raise your hand and Sylvia will put one in your hand because we're going to reference this a lot. I see one, two, three, four still. Yeah, cool. Five, that's your sixth one, Ebony. Second, okay. If Sylvia will give you one. Yes. So, so this is going to become, this little booklet's going to become very useful here in the coming weeks. As, as I mentioned just a minute ago, we're going to start diving or delving right into the principles themselves. So um, this should be... Um, this should be a good time to really, really begin um, laying this very, very important foundation um, in, uh, in embracing and understanding um, how to study the Bible. That's really our goal. That's our hope. Uh, before we dive into this, I'm going to share a verse that we often refer to in, um, in our church and uh, in Bible study. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15, because this verse is pretty much the heart of this little series that we're doing. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. And I'll tell you what, before we pray, I'm sorry, before we read that verse, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll jump right into this, our time together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for um, these very precious folks Lord, that are here tonight so that they could start um, gleaning and embracing and considering, Lord, these very significant and profound principles to Bible study. And Lord, I pray that as we spend this time together in the coming weeks and months, as we look at these 15 very profound principles, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would just open our hearts. He would open our minds and reveal to us, Lord, whatever it is that that you have for each and every one of us. I pray, Lord, that um, that you would, um, again, just uh, lead us into all truth as you promised you would to your disciples. Lord, before you departed them in uh, John 16, Lord, I pray that as your disciples in this day and age, that you would lead us to all truth. Thank you for your spirit, who is the, the real teacher here tonight. And uh, Lord, again, I just pray that you would just guide our thoughts, our actions, our words, as we spend time together in your word, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Um, again, I'm not sure, David, where's that other mic? It's over here. I don't see Tim, uh, Tim Sanchez, so who, who, wants to, uh, who wants to be our, Marvin, you want to do it? Who wants to be our uh, band, Kenny, who, somebody, test. So um, there you go. Um, this mic is going to be in Van's hand. So if anybody's got a, a question or a thought, if something that I might have said doesn't quite make sense and you need some clarification or anything that uh, needs uh, some follow-up or feedback, uh, just raise your hand um, and we will 
um, acknowledge you and give you an opportunity to um, ask or if we need to expound on whatever is being taught, uh, this is your opportunity again. These Wednesday night Bible studies are very, very informal. Uh, we're here for you guys um, to make sure that um, we are able to glean what it is that God has for us in our time together tonight. So again, this little booklet that we handed out is a very useful tool. These principles that we're going to be unpacking here in the coming weeks are uh, right out of our Discipleship 3 um, tool, which is uh, our How to Study the Bible tool. Hence, the uh, cover of the booklet is also referred to as our How to Study the Bible booklet. And again, the, the information in the book booklet is, are just excerpts from that thicker tool, that thicker book um, that George, uh, Sylvia Barella, and uh, I worked on several years ago, back in 2016, 17, I think. And um, it's something that hopefully will bring everybody through at some point in a more comprehensive study. Uh, but for now, just as a follow-up to a lot of your questions last fall when we were looking at our Q&A series, our question and answer series, you guys were asking, well, how do you do that comparing scripture with scripture thing? The concordance thing came up, and um, it was just kind of a natural, and I, I, I prayed and asked, well, what would you do us through the spring? So what we're doing is we're taking an excerpt from our Discipleship 3, How to Study the Bible Tool our series, and uh, doing a kind of uh, synopsized version and focusing primarily on the principles of Bible study. There's 15 of them. And again, they're on page number three in the booklet. So if you guys want to use a little booklet to take notes, whatever it is, we're going to look at uh, the first one tonight, this whole context thing and its importance, and um, how all these principles as we move forward, how they connect, how they depend on each other, how they're integrated, uh, so that when you start opening the Bible for yourself, uh, what's really cool, the Spirit of God will just kind of open the text up to your thing. Um, we have some more booklets if you would like one. Uh, who else needs one? Oh, yeah, Maureen needs one. Arlene needs her fifth one. Just for tonight, okay. Uh, so a couple more over here. Marv, I don't oh, Yeah. And... Um, yeah, so um, again, we will often refer to various little tables or diagrams in the booklet. Again, this is, uh, this is nothing more than a um, quick, handy, uh, quick reference tool, if you will, to, um, to that particular part of our discipleship series. Um, those of you that have been around here, we throw that little Mount Everest scene up to show this progression or this ascent up Everest because... Our hope and our prayer always, always, how's he doing? Better today. Okay, we'll talk after if that's cool. We'll let you give everybody an update so we can continue to pray. Okay. Um, what did I just say? I don't know. <laughs> Mount Everest, yeah, is, is really when we talk about ascent or ascending um, or transforming, we use all these different terms and metaphors um, really, the goal here, the idea here is transformation, which simply means becoming more like Christ each and every day. And um, when that happens in our journey, in our lives, um, we're able to be equipped and be able to have the capacity to deal with whatever life throws at us. Because I don't have to tell you, man, this world's getting more and more bizarre by the day. And uh, so... Yeah, we may be focusing on what you would consider some Bible study stuff, but we will go through and we'll talk current events, we'll talk things, and we'll talk issues and pro prophetic stuff. As a matter of fact, next week's Bible study, when we look at the, uh, the, three, the three people groups that the Bible is written to, are going to be really key. In two weeks, we're going to look at timelines and the significance of those timelines. And then when we get to the fourth principle in, a, in three weeks out, we're going to look at the three applications of Scripture. And one of those applications is the prophetic application and the importance and the significance of prophecy to the believer, especially in the day and age in which we find ourselves. So that's kind of where we're headed. But I wanted to just share a quick verse with you to kind of, um, again, 
uh, keep us a little bit focused and, and never lose sight of um, our goal. Um, and if you remember this, we, laid, we did lay out some goals uh, when we started our study a few weeks ago. Um, but 2 Tif- Timothy chapter number 2, verse 15, is the theme verse for our How to Study the Bible series. For every level of discipleship that we have in our church, we always embrace a, um, a theme or a verse. For example, in our intro to discipleship, when we introduce people to, to God's mission for the church in this day and age, um, our proof text is um, the, gospel of chap- uh, the gospel of Matthew chapter 28, verse no- verses 18 and 19. Go ye therefore, right? That's our charge. When we start talking about discipleship in and of itself, we start talking or we reference a lot of verses out of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.2 2 in particular. But when we talk about verse 15, um, this is a charge that the Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian that ever lived, uh, gives to a young man that he discipled, uh, Timothy. Uh, we, those of you that were here on Sunday, we were... We made reference a number of times in our sermon, if you remember that, to the letter to the Ephesians. Um, Paul writes that letter to the Ephesians to prepare that body of believers for Timothy to show up and ultimately become the pastor of that church. So Paul was used by God to just do some amazing things in, in orchestrating and preparing and equipping this young man to ultimately take on this amazing church at Ephesus that we know in the Bible was the foundation or the launching pad for the church age. Um, that's why it's referred to or it's defined as the fully purposed church because in the letter to the Ephesians, Paul is very, very explicit in terms of revealing to us the purpose and the role of the church. Um, as w- those of you that have been around here, you know that we're in the letter to, Co- the, the, letter to the Colossians and um, the letter to the Colossians we're referring to as the letter to the last day's church. And you guys know why that's the case now, because we've been spending time together looking at that whole historical and prophetical implications of that. But that said, um, the letter to the Colossians, although you find a lot of similar passage in the two letters, they're very different in their context and in their content even, because the context in Colossians is really more about reminding the last day's church the significance of who Christ is in our lives. And Paul drives that issue home. So um, Paul is preparing this young man, and he writes this letter, this Second Timothy letter, to this young man that he loved, that he discipled, that he viewed as his spiritual son. And this second letter to Timothy is the last letter that he writes to anybody, to a church, to individuals, and um, it's very heartfelt. If you go through and read the entire letter, it's very significant. You could see Paul probably, not probably, he mentions the fact that he's in tears because he's leaving this young man that he had invested in, that he developed a relationship with, and this is why discipleship is so important to us in our church, the connections and the relationships that happen as we spend time together in God's word. But he says this to him in the 15th verse of um, of 2 Timothy. Mind you, these are some of his last words written to anybody. He says, Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. And the operative word or the verb that is in this verse is the the um, the charge or the challenge to become a student of God's word. And this is what this whole series is about. This is what we're about as a church. We can't just be a church that just opens up the, the Bible on a Sunday morning and pulls out a verse just to kind of lay out a nice sweet message to get us through the week or the day or whatever, but to really equip you with how to study God's word so that you alone could go to him, so that you alone could depend on him. And as we get into these these principles of Bible study, um, you're going to know these. And as you master them over time, um, it's really awesome how God is going to reveal and he's going to give you truths and and principles and things to live your life by. Uh, So you're not always being spoon-fed from the pulpit, but you're going to God on your own, um, in your own time together with him, 
But the charge to Timothy is to become a student of God's word. He says, study to us a food unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And we're not going to get into the implications of the whole why would he say that about his shame? Because one of these days, as we've already seen a couple different times, everybody in this room, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you will give an account for your life. So that's what he's driving home. And then he says this. This is really significant. And this is where these principles come in. And this is why these rules matter. Look what he says next. Rightly what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. So what's the implication as you read that last phrase? Any thoughts? Say it again. Clarissa? That you can wrongly divide it, yes. How God's word's laid out. And that's, that's you're both correct, but here's, here's what I'm really looking to or looking for, is we have to understand that in God's word, there are divisions in it. And in order to really understand and get a good grasp and embrace this whole becoming a student of God's word, we have to know and understand what those divisions are. So one of the things that we're going to unpack, one of the things that we're going to learn in the coming weeks as we look at these 15 principles is you're going to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth. And the reason why there's so many religions and denominations and cults is because people have failed in this area right here in becoming and learning what it means to be a student of God's word. So that's the hope. That's the goal. And again, as you'll see, as we start to look at these these principles, there's really nothing that difficult. All you have to do is learn um, and, and, and we'll, get, we'll also get them in your hands. We'll get a couple other tools that I want you guys to be mindful of and be aware of, um, like a Strong's Concordance. When we get to the patterns of Bible study, I mean, the, princi- the, 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 the pattern principles, uh, it's there where we're going to show you how to use the tool. Um, we'll give you a little demo on some really cool uh, online software, online Bible software that you can use. I think I've shared this with you a couple of times. Um, Anymore, my Bible, I use it to read and to memorize Scripture, and especially my study Bible, which is this one here. There's certain passages and verses that are on a certain location on the page. Everybody have have experienced that with your with your hard copy Bible? What this is my Bible, so when I'm reading and I'm memorizing Scripture and I'm looking for notes from way back in the day before there was software available, the Bible software available online. Um, this, is, this was my study Bible, and I still take notes in it, and I still document things, and I still lay things out. But I do all my word and phrase studies with software now. It's amazing how fast and effective and efficient um, you can just glean truth from just doing a very basic thing. So we're going to show you, or I'm going to share with you the one piece of software that I recommend. And here's, you want to hear what's really cool? It's free. It's free. And it's out there. All you have to do is go up and download it. And all kinds of um, commentaries are available. But the, the most important thing that, I've, that, that you have with certain pieces of Bible software is that they've integrated the concordance, Right? So you don't have to have that separate book that's this thick to do these word and phrase studies that we're going to look at here in the coming weeks and months on how to do that. So, yeah, I'm really excited. I'm really thrilled about being able to, to, to share these, these principles with you in the, coming, in the coming weeks. So it's all about um, becoming a student of God's word, not just a student, um, as you all know, stu- being a student is just one aspect of our journey. But you'll never learn and you'll never know God's word if you don't embrace that truth that we just read here in verse number 15. Okay, everybody with me? We good? Um, so last time we were together a couple weeks ago, I think we did the video thing, right? We did that intentionally because there was a lot of discussion or a lot of questions about the rapture. Hang on to those thoughts. As a matter of fact, I got a call from a, from a guy today. We were on the phone for about an hour and a half asking me, why are all these, these different notions or ideas? Hang loose, man. In a couple of weeks, we're going to look at some timelines where we're going to define and lay out 
some events, some prophetic events that are just around the corner as we connect all these dots, as we integrate these principles together. Um, but if you remember from three weeks ago, a month ago, when we launched this or we kicked this whole thing off, um, we started with kind of taking a step back, right? Took a step back and I said to everybody, let's just, let's just look at the big picture. Let's just really focus on, on uh, why we even exist. Why are we here? One of the cool things that I experienced um, when I was first exposed to God's word in a, a Monday night Bible study several years ago in Kansas City, um, I was blown away how the answers to life were, were, I, were being revealed to me through the Bible. I was just blown away. I mean, I, I was getting answers to questions I didn't even know I had. Uh, so notions and thoughts like, where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Are all found within the pages of this book. And um, what I wanted us to do from uh, when we launched our little study here from a few weeks ago was just let's look at the big picture. And if you remember this, I likened it to a what? To a puzzle, a puzzle box, right? And um, has anybody ever gone to the store to Target and bought a puzzle without a picture in front so that you can know <laughs> what you're going to piece together? That would be kind of weird, huh? I'm sure you can. And um, I don't know if I would want to attempt that, but you can, right? Uh, but um, that was what we did in that first week. We just took kind of a step back, and we said, all right, here's the big picture. Here's what we can't lose sight of. And if you remember, as part of that whole series, that little section that we did, that big picture section, um, I shared with you that it's important, it's imperative that you never lose sight or you never forget as you get into God's word the very theme of the Bible. The Bible has a theme. There's a reason why God gave us his word. And who could remind me what that is? What is the theme of God's word, Van? Yeah, exactly. I heard two answers. You're both right. It's a battle for a kingdom and a throne. The premise of God's word is really that simple. It's a, it's a battle for a king and it's a battle for a throne, right? So as you look at history, as, as we start to delve into the timelines next in a couple of weeks, you're going to know what happened, what transpired, and what we refer often to as eternity past. The reason why God created time and the way, time, the way he revealed it to us in the first chapter of Genesis as he's restructuring, he's putting this thing called the universe together, he's doing it because of some significant event that happened way, at, way back in eternity past. And what was that? Satan's fall. The fall of Satan. That's why you're here. And as you've heard me say a number of times, and I might say it in passing, whether it's a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning, this whole theme, this whole Bible story is nothing more than God redeeming a fallen creation, which is as you look at the cosmos, right? As you look at... Hasn't the night sky been awesome the last couple of nights? It's been incredible. Just look up and know that there's a purpose for what you're able to see in the night sky every year. He's redeeming that someday. He, he's also going to redeem this planet, right? Revelation chapter 21. And then he's also, because you and I happen to live on planet Earth, he's also got a plan to redeem his fallen creatures and whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, whether you like it or not, we're here today and we accepted him as our savior and what he did on the cross for us for the sole purpose of bringing about redemption. Redeeming a fallen nature that played out way back in Genesis chapter number three. So that's really in, in a nutshell the whole premise so when you start unpacking and you start looking at the Bible, it's imperative that you study or that the, and understand the story. The Bible needs to be understood in light of Satan's fall, in light of the fall. That's why we exist. That's why the timelines exist. This is why we're here. 
Now, what we're going to learn and what we're going to be able to, to grasp in the coming weeks is we're going to be looking at this very interesting term, this thing called a dispensation. We're going to learn how God dispensed or has dispensed his grace differently throughout history to bring about redemption. Because at the end of the, at the, end of the day, as you go from eternity past to eternity future, ultimately when God's kingdom, this fallen kingdom that we all find ourselves in, when that kingdom gets restored, it's because of God coming through on everything that he fulfilled. So the story of the Bible also needs to be understood in light of God's plan, his plan to redeem. And like I said earlier, just a few minutes ago, He's redeeming three things, the universe, this planet, earth, and you and I, because you just happen to live here. And know and realize and understand the fact that there's an enemy, there's an adversary. That's what the term, that's what the the Old Testament word for Satan is, the Hebrew word for the word Satan is adversary. You have an enemy, I have an enemy, and he desires nothing more than to usurp he led a, uh, a mutiny in eternity past where God had to do what he did in order to bring about a redemption. And we're going to talk about the amount of time that it took God to redeem. It hasn't been a whole heck of a long time. It really hasn't in light of the bigger picture. So don't lose sight of that as you consider, um, consider um, the big picture. We also, if you remember from that part of our introduction, that part of our study, also mentioned the fact that God had a plan to restore his what? His kingdom in the Old Testament. And it happened for a little while. It happened during the reign of King Solomon when the temple was built. The entire planet was going to Jerusalem to to worship the God of Israel and And it was amazing what God was doing in the Old Testament. And if you remember that part of the story, what happened with Solomon that caused the fall ultimately, or God not to cause Solomon to fall, but really the kingdom was lost in the Old Testament. Bunch of wives, that was an outcome. But what was the one thing? We talked about this on Sunday. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. What did he do? Say it again, Sylvia. Yeah, he started focusing on his stuff. Mark this down. This is the principle of first mention. It's going to be one of our principles that we'll look at in a few weeks. Um, The first time the number 666 shows up in your Bible. It's It's significant. It's profound. It says in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse number 14, that the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 600, three score and six. Chapter 10, verse number 14. And from that point on, his life and the kingdom goes to hell in a handbasket. In chapter 11, God removes the kingdom from him. In chapter 12, there's a civil war. And during that time is when all these minor prophets and major prophets from Isaiah all the way to Malachi start to show up to say, all right, Israel, all right, God's people, let's get, let's get our act together. Remember our study from the summertime last summer? We were looking at the minor prophets. That's why they show up. Did it happen? Did the kingdom get restored in the Old Testament? No. How do we know that? Just look at history. Just study history. We're going we're gonna to look at a term next week, the Gentiles. You know what God did in the Old Testament because of, the, because of Solomon's fall? He turned them over to be ruled and controlled by Gentile nations. So think about this for a second. It's 600, I'm sorry, 1,000 B.C. to 900 B.C. And man, everything's hunky-dory. And then you get to 600 B.C., and now the Babylonians have taken God's people captive. And then the Persians. As soon as we're done with Colossians, we're going to focus on the book of Esther. We're going to show you where God's people found themselves in the Old Testament because of there. You know what Jesus referred to as that period in Luke chapter 21, verse number 24? 
as the times of the Gentiles. Did you know you're still living in the times of the Gentiles? You are. So you have the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. And if you know anything about history, again, that's we're going to look at the applications of history. You need to become a bit of a history buff. I know we didn't. We, a lot of us grew up hating history. Man, you have to know and you have to love biblical history in order to understand. I'm not talking about secular history. I'm talking about biblical history. Because the secular world has lied to you about actual events and the significance of the Israel's role in God's plan. That's who he chose to use as we, and we'll see that next week when we start looking at principle number two, the principle of the people groups that make up the Bible, that the Bible's written to. Well, here's an interesting thought. Here's an interesting fact. Study it out. The Roman kingdom, the Roman Gentile empire has never gone away. It just morphed. It morphed from being a pagan Roman empire into being what? Being papal. And it still exists to this day. And what you see going on in the world today has a lot to do with their influence and their hand and their behind the scenes in manipulating. And this is why Poland's playing a big role. You should study the history of Poland and what's going on and their role with the whole Ukrainian crisis that we see happening right now. My hope and my prayer, man, is that we just remove the scales the veil so that you know and you're able to connect dots with all the stuff that's happening. It's really cool, man. We live in exciting times because we're seeing the Bible coming to fruition like never before. So these principles are key. They're significant. They're so profound. And we have to never, ever, ever, ever lose sight of the big picture. All right? And we know what that is now. It's a battle for a kingdom. And it's a battle for a throne. And um, the important thing to understand and and embrace and grasp is where is that throne today, spiritually and ultimately physically, right? And as we start looking at some of the timelines in a couple of weeks, you're going to see some of those prophetic events that are going to be revealed to us about how God's going to ultimately and finally um, bring about his kingdom on this earth. So when Jesus gathered the disciples together at the, at, the, at the Sermon on the Mount, and he began to teach them, and he lays out the Lord's Prayer, he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He meant that. <laughs> he meant that. All they had to do was own their role and their responsibility in seeing the kingdom come through, come to fruition. And even that failed, didn't it? And you'll see how God kicks the can down the road. How God postpones the kingdom on earth. But during that postponement, he does something really incredible, really amazing. Who would tell me what that is? Who can tell me what that event is? I know you know. What did he do? Don't be talking to Jack, Sylvia. Tell, tell us out loud. He what? You know what he did? This is what we can't lose sight of. He birthed the church. He birthed the church age. The book of Acts. Did I, did I, I didn't say burn. Birth. <laughs> he didn't burn the church. He birthed it. Did, I, did it sound like I say birth? Yeah. Every once in a while, my North Kenya will come out. But uh. So we're going to talk principles. Never lose sight of the big picture. Keep that, keep that puzzle box always in the forefront, that image, that metaphor. But here's what's cool. When you unseal that box and you open that box, there's puzzle pieces, isn't there? And now it's, on, uh, it's incumbent on you to put those puzzle pieces together so that you could have the puzzle that's on that box. That's what these principles are. These 15 principles in this little booklet are those puzzle pieces. So we're going to put the puzzle pieces together in the coming weeks as um, this picture comes to light. And uh, that's our goal. So we use the term principle because of its 
uh, significance from a um, from a definition perspective. Uh, let me just give you a couple of thoughts about um, how Webster defines the word principle, the term principle. It's a truth or it's a law or law that provides governance to a situation or a circumstance. Did you catch that? A truth or a tenant that provide or a law that provides situation to a situation or circumstance. A law or fact of nature that explains how something works or why something happens. That's a principle. Hence the word of God. If you want to know what happened in God's word or how God's word works, we're going to learn how to apply those principles. You see it in nature, right? We call them the laws of what? Thermodynamics. There's principles that govern how nature works. The third law of thermodynamics proves God again, right? What is that principle or what is the rule of thir- the third law of thermodynamics prove? It proves entropy, physics. What does that mean? What does entropy mean? Anybody know what entropy is? It means chaos. You know what that really means? That you're deteriorating each and every day. Because anybody know what I'm talking about? I got, a, I got out of bed the other day, and my knee wouldn't work, and I didn't do anything except get out of bed. <laughs> right? You buy a new car, and give it a week or two, and it starts to what? It starts to deteriorate. Things began to fall apart. You know what that is? That's a natural law, a natural law of physics. You know why it's falling apart? Because of the fall. Because of what happened with Lucifer. That was never God's design. That was never God's intent. And he creates Adam, and we're going to look at that next week. When he creates that dude, he, did, he created him, he designed him, he made him to live forever. Now here's what's cool. And we talked about this on Sunday, right? If ye then be risen with Christ, then set your affection on things above, not the things of this earth. Remember that part? And we talked how when you accepted him as your savior, you know what he did? You know what God did, which is so awesome and so cool and so incredible? He seated you in a heavenly place. So spiritually, you're there. You're living there. You know where? You know what's holding you back? You know what's limiting you? This. And this thing's not going to be resurrected until what event? We're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks when we look at the timeline. The rapture. When this body finally catches up to where I'm at spiritually. Right? That's what God is. So when you get to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and Paul starts saying things like to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord or When you're in your body, you're going to be absent from the Lord. That's why. Because you're stuck in this stinking body. And when we let this world and this planet define us and we focus and we're more concerned about, thank you, Marvin, so much, our circumstances and our situations in life, then we start to lose perspective spiritually. We began to focus on what? earthly, carnal things, right? i big Matrix guy. Anybody ever watch The Matrix? You could take the red pill <laughs> and see things that you never imagined, or you could just go on living and just be another person on the planet, and that's where we're at today in the world, frankly. Or you can let this book just rip the scales off your eyes so you can see what this whole thing is really about. So now you're watching the news. Now you're understanding who historically as well as prophetically who the Russians are and their role in the Word of God. Did you know that they're prophetically going to play a huge role in the Bible? In other words, these things that are happening have to happen, have to play out in order for the next series of events to play out. That's the kind of stuff that we will consider, that we will be looking at. So... It's a truth or a law that provides governance to situations and or circumstances. Uh, it's also referred to or defined as a tenet, that which is believed, whether true or not, but which serves as a rule of action 
or the basis of a what? Of a system. So that's another little sub-definition for the word principle. Um, and the system, for lack of a better term, is what we'll lay out in a couple of weeks when we start looking at the time, the principle of time and the significance of these timelines. That's a system that God put in place in order for him to redeem a fallen universe, a fallen planet, and fallen and broken lives. Okay? So, let's, um, let's look at a couple little examples of what I'm getting at, and I think this will kind of help, this will kind of help us um, understand um, the whole principle thing a little bit better. And I think when we introduced, when we first met for the first time a few weeks ago, I think I threw this little example out, but I, again, I just, by way of reinforcing and and again, you hear me say this all the time, repetition is the price of learning. When you hear things over and over, finally it sticks, it'll, it'll, it'll come to you. But let me just share with you a couple little examples. Um, uh, you, any, any math people here? Any math teachers? This is a number two, see if I could get it right. Two plus um, five times three. Who can tell me what the who can tell me what the answer is? Seventeen. Who thinks it's seventeen? Who thinks it's something else? You think it's something else, Van? What do you think it is? You think it's twenty one. Is it seventeen? Could be both. Oh, it could, huh? See, you're part of the problem. <laughs> and I don't and I don't mean the problem problem. I mean math problem. Um, and, and, and again, if you, if you look and stop and consider just what we were talking about a few minutes ago about principles, about tenets that govern, right? There's governance to math equations. And as you've already seen, one of the principles that we're going to get into in a few weeks is the principle of numbers and how numbers are, play a key function and a key role in the Word of God, in the Bible, and I'm, that's not what today's about. But there's principles govern everything. And without principles, man, you can go off and just like Van, start your own religion. Start your own cult when you don't apply principles. Now, there's some principles. There's five of them that govern how equations work. And I'm sorry, that's a two, okay? So two plus five. He got 17. Why? Because he did... 2 plus 5 is 7 times 3 is 21. And then somebody else, 5 times 3. The rule is this, and you guys remember this from 7th grade math, Ben. <laughs> um, but there are some rules, right? It's called PEMDAS. Remember PEMDAS? P-E-M-D-A-S? That's it. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. That's how you can never forget it. What is the, what's the implication of PEMDAS? That anything in parentheses comes first, right? Then after parentheses, ex, exponents, ex, exponents, then multiplication, then division, then addition, then subtraction. That's PEMDAS. Well, you know what? You get a tassel tonight for tonight. So... Those of you that said it was 21, you're, I mean 17, you're absolutely right. Because if you apply PEMDAS to this equation, multiplication shows up or comes before what? Addition. So you have to do 5 times 3 first. There's 15 plus 2 equals 17. Then you go and start your own religion. And that's exactly what's gone on with the Bible over history. The reason why, especially in this country, there are so many cults and so many false religions is because people fail to apply principles of Bible study, to study to show us that approved a workman unto God that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing what? The word of truth. So just like you're going to rightly divide an equation you need to rightly divide the Bible. Should we do one more? Why not? 
six times. We're going to let Van give us the answer. Is that okay? Come on, man. <laughs> give us. Who can give me the, the right answer? Huh? Why is it 48? Parentheses first, man. Right? Pemdas. Poor. Okay. It's 48. So you do what's in the parentheses first. 5 plus 3 is 15 times 6 is, I'm sorry, 5 plus 3. 5 plus 3 is 8. 8 times 6 times 8 is 48. So the answer, the right answer, is 48. What do some people do? They go left to right, right? That's kind of how we're wired in Western civilization. Everything's left to right without any, without, without any true rules or applying rules. And some people do 6 times 5 is 30 is... Um, six times five is 30, plus three is 33. So the right answer is 48. It's 48. Yes. I'm glad you brought that up. No, that's, it's important. You need to understand what, why we follow a base 10 system. Anybody have no idea? Anybody know what base 10 versus base 2 or base 15 means? Why it's base 10? Look at your little booklet real quick. And somebody l go look at the table for numerology. This is, these are important questions. This isn't important. We use a base 10 system. In other words, 10 numbers, 0 to 9, right? And then we start over. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Look at the number 10. Say it again. Gentiles. You're living in the times of the Gentiles, man. Believe it or not, the Gentile ru world rules right now. This is what Jesus referred to as the times of the... This times of the Gentiles will come to an end. And sooner than you think. There's also another phrase in the, in the Bible that we'll look at probably next week. This depends on how things play out, it's known as the fullness of the Gentiles. There's a difference between the events that play out in Romans 11, fullness of the Gentiles, versus um, Luke 21, 24, times of the Gentiles. Uh, again, what does that mean? The words and the phrases matter. And if you don't unpack the words and the phrases and apply principles of Bible study then you're going to get the wrong answer, just like Van did three times on the screen. Right? Make sense? So this is where we're headed. So real quick, um, by way of overview again in terms of where we're headed, David, could you bring up, who's running the screen? Is that Mateo? That's David. <laughs> I saw the hat is all. Thanks, David. Um, but look at real quick. These are the four different types of principles that we're going to be unpacking. Um, the first four, and they're in your booklet. I'm referring to these as the foundation principles, okay? So these are really key. If you can master at least the first four, you're gonna, th that's going to take you a long ways in terms of learning the principles of Bible study. Uh, I see some of you taking pictures but if you just turn to page three, they're in there. The principles are in there, but also the, the different types. So the, uh, the second type, uh, principles of five through eight, we're going to deal with patterns. Uh, let's back up a little bit because I want to go over the, the first four real quick. Tonight, we're looking at context. Everything ha is, has to be determined based on context. And the way you're able to determine context is by applying the other three that go along with it as we look at these foundation ones. The principle of peoples, you need to know, and we're gonna, that's the one we'll look at next week. Understand the fact that the Bible's written to three and only three groups of people. And they're on, they're on your page, the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church. The third principle, and I keep, making, I keep referring to this, is the principle of time. You're going to see where those three people groups show up on these timelines so you know how and when God is dealing with the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church. And also, when we unpack and we look at the timelines, 
you're going to see specific events. There's a reason that you have to draw a distinction between the rapture and the second coming. The guy that I was talking to on the phone today for an hour and a half, he had never heard that. And he's a, a, a believer. He's a, been a Christian for years. He goes, I never drew a distinction between the rapture and the second coming. You know what prompted him to think differently? Clyde Hayes told him to go watch a movie, to go watch the movie that we watched before the wrath. Right? So now you're seeing how and when the events play out and how certain events are dedicated to certain people groups. And then the third one is the principle of time. Again, timelines are important, man. I can't tell you how important and significant time is into God's plan. And uh, even the secular world recognizes. You know that there's, did you know that the secular world has what is known as a doomsday clock that they track even to this day? And we're, it's right before midnight right now. Even the secular world knows that this world's jacked and is headed in a very, very bad direction. And then the fourth principle, and we'll look at this. This is a really key one. When you look at the Bible, when you approach the Bible, approach it from three perspectives, historically, doctrinally, and inspirationally or devotionally. There's three applications so when I talk about applying the Bible doctrinally, that's the study part. Understanding theologically what the Bible is teaching you, not just historically, but also prophetically, okay? But there, the Bible also needs to be relevant to your life. In other words, you should be able to go to a verse and find some hope and find some application to, to live out, man. Because what, would the, what good is the Bible if all it is is all this crazy prophecy stuff and yet your life is falling apart. And then you also need to become, and we've talked about this a number of times, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, some, somewhat of a history buff. Understand that you have a history book in that book. It is a history book, all right? Those are the foundation principles. If you get these, man, you're probably 70, 60, 70% of the way there. So just like this building has a solid foundation and any house or any structure that doesn't have a so solid foundation, what happens? It begins to crack. It begins to collapse. So these four are really key in really understanding how the Bible is put together. In fact, take your Bibles to, um, and turn to uh, Matthew chapter number 7. Let's look at Matthew 7 real quick. Anybody have a red letter Bible? Right? This is going to be red letters, man. In other words, the, this, these are Jesus' words. Matthew chapter number 7. And I'm again reading in verse number 24. These, these are Jesus' last thoughts um, with his disciples as he's revealed to the, him, them, the constitution of the kingdom, a.k.a. also known as the what? The Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is revealed to you in three chapters. Chapters 5, I didn't even talk to you, 5, 6, and 7. I'm telling you, man, this spying on me already. 5, 6, and 7 are the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to Jesus' last words to the disciples at the Sermon on the Mount. Look at verse number 24. Therefore, Jesus, these are his words, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings, what sayings is he referring to? Everything from chapter 5 to this point. So whoever heareth these sayings of mine, he says, and doeth them, I will, like him, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Isn't that awesome? What a promise that is. When we're talking about the devotional application, take it home, man. No one realize that you hold a Bible that God wants to build a solid foundation with in your life so that when the storms of life come, you're standing firm. You know what you believe. You know what you stand for. 
You're fixed on Jesus, as we were talking about on Sunday. Look at the next verse. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which buildeth his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell. And listen to this, folks. And great was the fall of it. How many of us know people, Christians, man, I have guys that I went to seminary with, Bible Institute with, that I thought were solid dudes. And in hindsight, their foundation was cracked and, and they're nowhere around now, right? It happens, man, more often than not. And great is the fall of it. You and I, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, you're likened to a house. You are a habitation of God, Paul says in the letter to the Ephesians. You're the temple of God, he says to the Corinthians in chapter 6, verse number 19. And anything or any structure that's worth its weight in whatever has a what solid foundation. I think I've shared this little this little story with you when Larry and I first moved back from Kansas City and we were building our house in Tsuki. It was an extremely, extremely wet winter. Um, we moved back in September, October. Uh, it was already fall. By the time we were able to get permits and everything else, I don't think we started construction till like December. And man, it seemed like every other day we were getting six inches of a foot of snow my brother-in-law would call me because he was our builder and he would say man i need you to come over and shovel snow off your roof and i remember driving up into the driveway um to go see progress of the house and stuff and man our, we would get stuck there was just so much mud it was just so wet and yeah come about february march they finished the house and we moved in and that spring and summer when the rains came and they came, our roof started leaking. You know why? Our house was settling. It was settling because of all the moisture and everything that went on. <laughs> Am I giving you a nightmare story? <laughs> yeah. Right now? Yeah. Oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that. Thank God ours isn't sinking, but man, that summer, that fall, we were already putting new stucco on our house. We were getting cracks on the side of the house. Our roof was leaking. Isn't that interesting, though, that it was what was going down at the bottom that affected what was in the roof and the side of the walls? And it's not going to happen right away, but you know what? When the rains came and the winds blew... <laughs> Cracks begin to show up. And that's what happens in our lives when we don't have that solid foundation. So these four principles are really key. Look at the last two, the last two verses in the text. I love this. And it came to pass that when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were what? I love this phrase. They were astonished at his doctrine. They were blown away with what he taught them. Whoa, this Jesus is something else. Look what he says in verse number 20. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. This isn't about religion, man. Never has been. But God giving you everything that you need, man, so that you can get through this crazy thing called life. So just a thought about the importance of foundations in our lives. Um, the other group or the other type of principles um, that we're going to look at in, in the coming weeks, five through eight, are biblical patterns. Uh, this is where we're going to look at the importance and the significance of measured words. The words and the phrases are the keys to understanding its truths. So this is where we're going to use the concordance, and we're going to look at specific words and phrases. So um, when we start looking and comparing, for example, and if you run it, the phrase the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, you'll get a good glimpse that 
that Jesus isn't talking about the same things necessarily. Although they're, although they're synonymous when Jesus is present, when Jesus isn't present, they're two very distinct kingdoms. And you have to understand the phrases and see where they f- show up in context in order to understand the importance or the significance of that phrase or even that word. So this is how you're going to learn to become a Bible student. This is where I'm going to throw up this software that's going to help you do these words and phrases and we'll unpack those thoughts and those words. There's also the principle of first and full mention. The principle of first mention is where something shows up for the first time in Scripture. Um, You should mark it down, highlight it, circle it, whatever turns you on, whatever floats your boat, man. Just identify it because it's going to set a pattern through the rest of God's Word. For example, you should see what the Bible, if you want to to get a definitive definition for the word worship and what worship means to God, because it's crazy what Christians today think worship is, really is. Well, you need to get a biblical worldview, a biblical perspective of everything. I was talking to somebody just yesterday. Who was it? I don't know, somebody, uh, when we were discipling. Anyway, I shared it with them. I said, don't focus on what Christianity is doing today. Don't worry about all the spiritual craziness that's going on in the name of Christianity. Focus on what the Bible says. Be biblical in your worldview. And this is why these principles are key. My One of the adages, one of the things that I suggest to people all the time is always question. Never be a cynic, but you ought to be skeptical, especially in the day and age in which we live, right? Paul was a skeptic. You know how you know? Three times he tells the Colossians, let no man beguile you. Beware of this, beware of that. Jesus' first warning to the disciples in Matthew 24 as he was preparing them for the end times The very first thing he lists is in the last days, there's going to be a lot of deception. So you should be skeptical about what's going on and what this thing called Christianity today. This is why you have to have a biblical perspective, a biblical understanding, so that the word of God could be the filter to the craziness that we're all experiencing and seeing today. These principles will help you get that. We're going to look at the principle of spiritual discernment. This is the key. Th- this is the one key thing, man. We're going to see how you can compare scripture with scripture. And you know what's so cool? You're going to see how the Bible interprets itself. You don't need some dude interpreting the Bible for you. It interprets itself by simply comparing verses with verses. And that's what seven is about. And then we'll look at numbers, the importance of numbers in the Bible, these patterns, these significant role of numbers in the Bible. You know what I use numbers for, especially in the Bible? Association. I'm not sure why God wired me like that, but I use numbers a lot to know where certain verses are at. Could I give you like a really bizarre kind of idea as to how that works? Um, nah, we'll get there when we get to numbers. How's that? <laughs> Yeah, but I do. I just use numbers. My wife always makes fun of me because when I'm doing these combination lots, I don't think of the numbers. I think of, are you ready for this, Jack? Kenny, I think of football players. (laughs) So this lock is Mahomes and some other dude, (laughs) right? Those three numbers. And And I'll remember, and I'll never forget because, not because I have to remember the number, but because I remember who the player that's associated with that lock. Isn't that weird? You know, I remember the church's address, 2076 Galisteo. Not because I'm trying to remember 2076, because I remember two football players, and I will tell you who they are. <laughs> now you're thinking, this dude's really weird. You guys already knew that before you came in this room, so that's, it's all good. <laughs> then we're going to look at 9 through 12, and we're going to look at doctrines. Um, this is a really cool section. We're going to look at the importance of creation. And uh, this is a really cool section. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 is your, um, is your proof text. By the way, that's what the word full mention means. Every, every significant doctrine or theological truth that's in the Word of God, you should have a home base for it. 
Do you know what I mean by that? You should have a go-to verse. And that's up to you. That's between you and the Holy Spirit, whatever that go-to verse is. For example, um, if um, there's a young man that I was working with the other day that was, um, that was kind of unsure about the whole Jesus thing, who Jesus really is and his, the doctrine of the deity of Christ. And I showed him and I took him right away to Second, First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. That's my go-to verse to show him who the Bible, who Paul reveals to Timothy, who Jesus is when he says, God was manifest in the flesh. This is a great min- mis- uh, mystery. A great mystery. There's no controversy here. It could be John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You know why it's important that you have verses for those doctrines? Because you're not going to be carrying your Bible wherever you go. And in the culture and the day and age in which you live, if you pulled out your Bible, that person that's an American today would discount anything you have to say as a result. So, similitudes. This is a really cool one. We're going to talk about how um, God has these similarities. These are called echoes or a remez in Hebrew where God has allowed certain things to happen in the Old Testament and even throughout history that repeat themselves and then we'll look at teaching, uh, teaching by word pictures. And number 12, teaching by types, typology. There's a whole section in this little book it, on typologies and types. So when you're in the Old Testament and you're reading about some obscure dude named Shennacherib, right, who was the king of Assyria that took the 10 northern tribes captive, and all of a sudden you're seeing a prophecy of the Assyrian of an event yet to happen, now you make the connection and you're able to see how Shennacherib is a type of the Antichrist in, in biblical prophecy. So again, connecting dots as you apply principles. And then the last three, uh, establishing biblical attitudes. We'll just kind of lump these all together and do them all in one session, I think. But these are more abstract. These are more spiritual things like spiritual ma- maturity and, and biblical understanding. Um, What we're going to reveal to you there is don't rush the Holy Spirit. You're going to hear things and you're going to see things on these screens that are going to go right over your head and that's okay, man. Don't worry about it. Don't be discouraged. Just stay faithful. Just keep coming and God will, and then he's going to reveal it in his time and in his way. It took me a number of years for the lights to finally go off at times. So you have to be patient as you mature, as your eyes open. And um, I know that Jack and Sylvia have a new baby grandchild. And, um, and those of you that have babies or ch- little infants in your lives, you know that when you're talking to them, we kind of go into this little baby talk mode at times, do we not? Right? I don't like baby talk personally, but you know what? We, God has to do that with us with us at certain times where he's just defining terms and explaining terms. This is why I want you to ask questions. If I say something or you hear a a word out of the Bible that you don't understand or you don't know, ask. And that's the cool thing about children. They're constantly asking. Well, what's this or what's that? Ask, please, please, please. And um, so that's what that principle is about. Um, The principle of a submissive attitude. This is a hard one for Americans because we're such prideful people, <laughs> right? Um, this was a huge one for me. And uh, just growing up in Santa Fe, uh, a devout Roman Catholic, altar boy, the whole works, priest coming to our house to eat lunch at every other weekend after Mass. Uh, man, I thought this was, th- that religion was it, man. And I was... It took me a lot of a long time, years to unlearn things and let go of things before I actually was able to um, to God. So you have to you're gonna have to change a lot of what you believe as you go through this process as well. And and that's a hard one for a lot of us to regardless of our background. Um, your opinion, my opinion doesn't matter, right? We all have opinions. And as you've heard me say in the past, 
opinions are like armpits. Everybody has at least two, and uh, they both stink. Right? So your opinion might, but doesn't matter. My opinion doesn't matter. The issue is, what does the Bible say? And how are you going to get the? How are you going to get what the Bible says? Apply these principles. Just apply them, man. And um, a couple weeks ago on a Sunday morning, remember Psalms one eighteen eight? Who can quote that verse? Psalms one eighteen eight, the middle verse of the Bible, fourteen words. That's it. Hi, everybody said it. That's cool. It, that's, that's important because you're memorizing scripture. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Trust in the Lord. How do you get to trust the Lord? Or how do you get to trust anybody? What's the key to trusting someone? Getting to know them. So you know what we're doing in this process is we're just teaching you these principles so that you can better know God. Get to better know his word. You're knowing God through his word. All right? So that's maybe that's a high level overview of all 15 principles that we'll be looking at. Um, so let's look at number one, the principle number one, and it's quarter after already. So, um, hey, David, could you bring up the, the one slide that says, uh, gives us a definition of uh, text, context? I think that's how it reads. I think it's like the third slide down. There you go. Um, this is a really important thought. This is something that um, I want you to be mindful of as we unpack this particular principle. Again, keep in mind, um, especially with the foundation ones, these first four, they intertwine nicely. They're, they're interdependent on each other. So you're going to be able to establish context by knowing the people groups. So if you're in the Old Testament, right? If you're in the Old Testament, you're reading the book of Isaiah, and um, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 are talking about the coming Messiah. Who's Isaiah writing to in that context? To who? Israel. To Israel. He's specifically talking about the coming kingdom, although we live in a Gentile kingdom and we see those verses splattered on Christmas cards in the holiday season. That's cool and that's okay. But those verses are explicitly written to Israel in their context, both historically and prophetically, to reveal to them that the Messiah and his, his kingdom is real. That it's going to happen. So that is just a really basic, very simple example of what I'm getting at here. So your text is the Bible, right? And text or the Bible without context will always result in pretext. So just like Van, our buddy Van a few minutes ago, misapplied those PEMDAS rules, those mathematical rules, you know what he came up with? The wrong answer, which is pretext. Lord, let's look at the definition of these three words. Next slide, David. Just an important thought. This is the definition of text. The original words of something written or printed, in this case, the Word of God, the Bible, as opposed to a paraphrase, a translation, a revision, or condensation. That's what the word text means. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I often use the term when I'm referring to the Bible, right? I often refer to the text because what you're reading in this book is the text, now look at the next definition, context. Context is defined like this. Context is the part of a text or a statement that surrounds a particular word or passage and determines its what? And determines its meaning. So if you're reading Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, the example that I just used, you should know who Isaiah is. You should do, understand when Isaiah shows up historically and who and what kind of prophet was he. Um, now, what we'll do in the coming weeks is I'm going to share with you some other tools besides a concordance that I recommend that you get so that it'll help you determine and get an understanding of how and when these books and these letters or these Old Testament books were written. One of these great tools, and we can get you a copy. If you finish Discipleship 1, 
We'll give it to you as a gift. It's called Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. Amazing tool. It's kind of a synopsized version. We also have, if Larry, if you don't mind, can you bring those two books? Could you also, could you also bring up uh, Trotter's books, Larry, or Sylvia, or one of you? Do we have any Wilmington's books in there? So I think we do. You and Marie, and then bring Trotter's books as well. And then we also have these two volumes of uh, books written by a really close friend of ours. A lot of you met a year and a half ago, Mark Trotter, who passed away from cancer. Incredible book. He does a little synopsized, high-level, historical, doctrinal, devotional approach to every book in the Bible. It's called 52 Weeks of Pursuit. Really cool tool. Here's another thing. You can buy them from us, but we don't want to sell them to you. You know what we want to do? We want to give them to you. And you know how we give them to you? Get discipled. <laughs> Let us disciple you. We'll give it to you for free. So just a thought. All right? Um, but I'm going to show them to you because you can also get these on Amazon. If you want to go ahead and jump ahead, I would encourage you to start looking at some of these tools right away. But the most important tool that we'll put in your hands is that Strong's Concordance tool. That's going to help you um, apply the principles in the middle there, the patterns one. The words, the measured words, comparing Scripture with Scripture and so on. So let's look at the definition of pretext. Listen to this, watch. So text without context is pretext. What's pretext? Something that is put forward to conceal a true purpose or object. An ostensible reason or excuse. Isn't that an interesting definition? Thank you so much, Maria. I appreciate it. This is what Wilmington's looks like. Great book. Again, we give them for free. Uh, did you have you picked your book yet? Not yet. Oh, oh, you have a long ways to go. I already said. No, I'm kidding. So this is Wilmington's. Uh, great book. How many of you guys already have this? A lot of you guys do. That's good. And then these are Mark Trotter's books. Awesome, awesome tool. Fifty-two weeks of pursuit by Mark Trotter. Both both volumes are here. Just recently, they combined them, right, Larry? Uh, they're all in one volume now. And again. Great, great tool, and he covers each and every book from a historical, doctrinal, inspirational perspective. And then, this is it, the Strong's Concordance. And it's called Strong's Exhaustive Concordance because it was written by James Strong, and in order for him to do all these words, man, his dude was strong. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, what, the reason why it's referred to as an exhaustive concordance is because every word in the Bible is in here. In, in, um, in word order. So if you're doing a study on worship, for example, um, every occurrence of the word worship, both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, not the Hebrew and the Greek, every occurrence of the word will show up. And then it'll show you the, the original words that it was derived from. So just a very powerful tool. So um, that's where that comes in. All right? So again, um, important, it's imperative that you don't lose sight of this principle of context. And in the coming weeks, as we integrate the other three or the other, um, the other 14 or actually 12, because it's 1, 2, 3, 12 that are the, the practical ones, um, this will all begin to make sense. All right? Um, any questions or thoughts? Are we good? Yes, sir. Yes, that's a great point. Um, the question is, what tool do I use to find phrases? Very, very good point. You're not going to get phrases in a Strong's Concordance, the hard copy version. You will get it online. So this is why I teach or I use the online version for Bible studying. Um, I couldn't even tell you the last time I opened a, strong, a, a physical Strong's Concordance because everything's embedded now, and it's really awesome. So when we get to the comparing Scripture with Scripture, principle number seven, um, that's where we're going to show you how to do the words and phrase studies. But that's a very, very good question, because you're not going to get it from this book. Okay? Michelle? Uh, so, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. There's an online Bible piece of software. If you guys are familiar with uh, 
with Koine House, uh, Chuck Missler up at Coeur d'Alene, Idaho back in the day. Um, they did an amazing job developing an online Bible software called Blue Letter Bible. You can, there's also a, um, a, a Windows version and, a, and a, a, a mobile device version as well. Um, I don't think the mobile device versions are that great, but the, the web version is very good. Yes, Ben? No, it's not the same, and I'll have to show you why. When we get there, we'll show you the difference. You're not gonna get you're not gonna get the Strong's numbers, and we'll talk about what those are. Yeah, that's that's yeah yeah. Google freak, you could tell. Just Google it. No, my words. Those are my dad's words. Just Google it. Uh, so, uh, but that's a that's a really good point. So um, again, man, all we're trying to do is give you tools, tools, tools. Uh, so that you can become that 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 Bible student. All right. Um, again, keep in mind that looking and always being mindful of the importance of context in Bible study will keep you between the lines. Will keep you um, being able to rightly divide the Word of Truth. As we start to delve into some passages, I'll share with you. Um, like ex- especially in the book of Acts. Remember from our study a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at the New Testament? Remember when we did the big picture stuff? I shared it with you how in the Old Testament, the, um, the, in the Old Testament, the kingdom was lost. In the New Testament, the kingdom spiritually was restored. Right When you got saved, God's kingdom was restored. Well, um, there's three key books in your New Testament that you have to be mindful of and very aware of. As a matter of fact, if you go in your booklet... Uh, turn with me to page number, um, um, just so you get a good feel for this. Um, look at, um, look at uh, page number nine. Uh, actually, eight and nine are real, two really important pages to consider as you look at the New Testament. Okay? And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time in the whole, the whole Old Testament thing. But look quickly at the, at the New Testament and how it's laid out. And it's so important, so significant. Look at uh, page number eight first. What this little table gives you or provides you is a chronological view of where all your New Testament letters were written. Okay? For example, look at the first letter that was written in the New Testament chronologically. Which one is it? The book of what? The book of what? The book of the book of James, right? Right around the book of Acts, chapter number 11, 12. James had to have written it before he died because he dies in Acts chapter 12, right? So it's the first book. But is, don't you find it interesting that it's one of the last books in your New Testament? What's God doing? Why isn't it laid out chronologically, Right? And then as you make your way through, look at the other one that shows up. Look at the next two that show up, the, the, the letters to the Thessalonians, chronologically, written around 50 to 53 AD during Paul's journeys in Greece as he, um, through Asia Minor as he's writing to the churches in Greece. But the last letters that are written to churches in the New Testament are Colossians and Thessalonians, the very last letters. Why? Because God set up a certain system. The Spirit of God laid out a fascinating structure in His New Testament that is preserved for us in how your New Testament is laid out today. God does, there's there's purpose behind everything that God does. Now here's a key thought. Now flip over to page number um, number nine. Because these these two pages kind of go hand in hand because they're both revealing to us the significance of how the New Testament is, um, is structured. Look at the left column. And you better get this. There's three transitional books in your, bio, in your New Testament. Three. Matthew, what? Acts and Hebrews. And you know what's interesting? Every... Not every, but 90, 80, 90% of any false teaching that is out there 
comes from one of those three books. Matthew, Acts, or Hebrews. You name it. As a matter of fact, let me just give you a couple because they're in my notes. This is what happens when you don't rightly divide the word of truth. Anybody ever hear of the unpardonable sin? Anybody know what the unpardonable sin is? The one now? Blaspheming of the Holy Ghost, right? Okay, what's the context of that phrase? That phrase is in the Bible. Blaspheming the Holy Ghost, the unpardonable sin. You know what they don't do when they, when they talk about, when Christians use the phrase unpardonable sin? They never stop and consider the context. Anybody knows where the blaspheming the Holy Ghost phrase shows up in, in the text? Matthew what? Matthew 12. You nailed it. What's the significance of Matthew 12? That's, the, that's exactly when Israel rejected the king and the kingdom. He's done. That was the blaspheming of the Holy Ghost. Now, you could apply that inspirationally to the, to the believer, to the church, but it's not written to the believer. It's written to Israel. Are you with me? Right? So people take that out of context. Now, what's blaspheming the Holy Ghost in the New Testament practically? You know what it is? It's rejecting Christ, rejecting grace, the free gift of grace. Let me give you another example. As a matter of fact, um, Bob Lee, Tish, Sylvia, who else was in Israel with me a couple years ago? Um, we went to a place called uh, Caesarea Philippi. You know what the significance of Caesarea Philippi? Think about the two names that make up the name of that city. Caesar and a, and a Caesar by the name of Philippi. You know what it was? It was, it was, the, it was the hotbed of idolatry in northern Israel. So you get to Matthew chapter number 16, right? A transitional book. And Jesus sits the disciples down and he says to Peter, I'm going to give you the, the keys to the kingdom in that passage, right? You know what he was referring to? What's going to happen in the millennium. So hang with me because you're going to see what's going to happen prophetically when Jesus returns and what Peter's role is going to be during the return of Jesus' kingdom. But you know what happened? The church, the Roman church, took that verse out of context and said, now we got this dude Peter standing up in heaven at the pearly gates deciding who gets in and who gets out. Right? Context. He's not talking about pearly gates. He's talking about the 12 gates that are going to be made up around the temple when the millennial temple is built, Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48. And guess who one of the key guys holding the keys to the kingdom is going to be? Peter. And then you know what else happens in that thing? What does Jesus say in that passage? Upon this what? Upon this rock, I will build my church. So who's the rock? 1 Corinthians 10. The Bible interprets itself. It's Christ. But who's the rock in the Roman church? Peter. Peter. Context. Kingdom. You can start any religion you want, man. You name it, it has happened. It continues to happen. So many false teachings and so many far, false beliefs, even out of baptism, out of the book of Acts. There are religions out there that believe that you have to be baptized in order to go to heaven. And you know where they get that from? The next transitional book, look at your list. The book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. I've seen bumper stickers, Obey Acts 2, 38. When I see a bumper sticker on a car that says Obey Acts 2.38, you know what it tells me? I can mark them right away that they're a disciples of Christ person. That's what they believe. Well, who's Acts chapter 2 reading? Who's, who, who, what's going on in Acts chapter 2? What's the context of Acts chapter 2? Pentecost. The Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost, right? So what are we, what are we dealing with when Peter says in that passage that you have to repent and be baptized, right? Because... The kingdom's coming. You know what? There was still a possibility for the kingdom to happen. 
that it could have still been applied. So he's reiterating what John the Baptist was preaching in Matthew, Matthew chapter 3. When John shows up, he goes, hey man, all right Jews, repent, be baptized for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then everything changes radically after Stephen gets stoned in Acts chapter 7 and the Ethiopian eunuch comes to Christ in Acts chapter 8. Right? Could I show you something really interesting? Really fascinating in, in your Bible as it relates to that doctrine. Because the doctrine of baptism is important. We believe in baptism in our church, but not for salvation. You don't get baptized to get saved you're baptized, you're not baptized for salvation, you're baptized because of salvation. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch. But did you know that there's religions out there that teach that you have to be baptized or you won't go to heaven? You grew up in one if you grew up a Roman Catholic. Disciples of Christ believe that. Mormons believe that. So, man, we can get really screwy on the whole doctrine of baptism. That's why that's lesson number three in our discipleship lessons, right? Let me show you an interesting passage in your Bibles. Look at Acts chapter 8. You're all familiar with this story, right? Again, rightly divide the word of truth. You have to understand what's going on, man, that the book of Acts is a transitional book. God's moving from Peter to Paul, from Israel to the church, from meeting in synagogues to meeting in buildings, and yes, from going to meeting on Saturdays to meeting on Sundays. You know where they meet on Sundays? Go look at Acts chapter 20 sometime, the first day of the week. Why the first day of the week? Anybody know? Why the first day of the week? What is significant? Because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. Go look at Mark, before we look at Acts 8, look at Mark 1. Look at this. I think it's Mark 1. Look at Mark 1. Mark 1? No. Mark 16, 1. I don't know, one of those verses. This is, our, this is right after the crucifixion. Are you guys in Mark? Um, look at chapter 16, verse number 1. And again, you're st you'll start to see why the words matter, why the phrases matter. Look at Mark chapter 16, verse number 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and, and Salome, when was, it, when was the Sabbath for a Jew? On Saturday, right? Right? When do we get to the Easter season? We're going to do something really cool in our church, but we'll talk about that when we get there. And watch this. And he brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And barely early in the morning on the what? First day of the what? First day of the week. Every time you read that in the Gospels, whether it be Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, the first day becomes significant. So when Paul shows up in Acts chapter number 20, he says, you know, when the church is going to start meeting on the first day, that's why we meet on the first day. Yeah, the Sabbath is still the seventh day. I'm not denying that. But who was the Sabbath written for to? Principle number two. For to who? To Israel, to Jews. You're the church. You want to meet on Saturday? That's cool, man. Whatever floats your boat. You live under the age of grace. So it becomes important, it becomes significant. So now the words and the phrases begin to make sense. They begin to matter. So now you're looking at these words and now you're, you're seeing and you're realizing there's a reason why God has them in his word. Because you're not Israel, you are the church. You are the church. We are part of the church. So he comes to rescue Israel in the second coming to establish his kingdom on this earth, but he comes to marry you right before the wrath, right? Before the wrath. How, what was the name of that movie? Before the wrath. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? So where was I? Acts chapter 8? Yeah, check this out. 
Are you guys ready for some, a little mind-blowing thought here? This is why the text matters. And I will stand before you and I, that be, not to be critical of any of texts or versions that you may use, but I'm telling you the text matters because of places like what we're about to read. And this is a, this is a significant truth that frankly is left out of a lot of translations today because of this whole issue of, of works versus grace. So you get to Acts chapter 8, man, the transition is pretty much done. He's, it's complete. Israel got, Israel had their last chance, their third strike. Talk about three strikes and you're out, right? They killed John the Baptist, the Jews did. Then they killed Jesus. Then they kill Stephen. If you read Acts chapter 7, you know what, and you know, you, know what, you know what Stephen is doing? He's ripping on them, man. Do you guys not know who he was? And guess who's present during this sermon? Paul, holding everybody's coats, probably the guy in charge because he was a leader. And I would go as far as to say that Paul probably said, all right, pick up the rocks and kill this dude. And they did. And God shuts the door. Done. Look at, look at your numerology chart. What does the number eight represent? What does it represent? Number eight, never ends. It's continual, new beginnings. You know what eternity is in your Bible? Eight, right? The eighth note is a new beginning. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do is the eighth note, right? Music person? Never ends, never ends. There's seven days to God's plan. We're going to see that in a couple of weeks when we lay out the seven dispensations. The seventh and final dispensation is the kingdom, the Sabbath, the seventh day. The seventh day is always significant in God's plan. It's always been a significant. Just go back to Genesis chapter one, and he spends all of chapter one focusing on the six days of creation. On the sixth day, he creates Adam, and on the seventh day, chapter two, he even changes the chapter number, and he says, on the seventh day, God blessed that day and sanctified it. He set it apart. You know what that seventh day is to the Jews? Anybody know the Sabbath? Well, guess what that means prophetically? Guess what the seventh day represents prophetically? The millennial reign. Thank you, Larissa. You nailed it. That's what it represents one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Second Peter three eight. So even his, even his, the number of days that he chose, God could have created everything in a second, in a nanosecond, but he chose six days and rested on the seventh. Why? Because he was tired, because he was exhausted. Well, the Bible says he did rest from all his work. No, you know what he was doing. He was laying out a timeline for you and for me, unbeknownst to us. So you get to chapter 8, new beginnings, right? And you guys have been around here for a while. You know that Jesus' charge to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, immediately after they were still questioning and wondering, wondering when he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel, I say, all right, Lord, thanks for revealing all this cool stuff to us about spirit, all these spiritual things, but when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They ask in verse 6 of chapter 1. And Jesus says, not for you to know the times or the seasons, but to be what? But to be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost. Jerusalem and Judea, he says, you know what? I want you to focus on Israel first. This is why, guess who's at Pentecost? Gentiles? bunch of Jews, O ye men of Israel, O ye men of Israel, three times in chapter two. Pentecost is considered a what? A Jewish feast. It's one of seven Jewish feasts in your Bible, Leviticus chapter 23. Yes, Michelle? Is 
is that on Pentecost? Pen What's that? Oh. So when Peter opens the door so, to the Gentiles. So Pentecost um, was a major historical event, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, it was. And that in Acts also the church was born, birthed. Um, did that fall on Pentecost as well, if you look at the Jewish Again, holidays? And this is a great point, a great question. And if, you, and if you're not careful, you, you, you'll fail in rightly dividing the word of truth. And here's where I'm going with that whole thing. Although you can technically say that the church was birthed at Pentecost, right? Because that's when it's born. And the, all the early believers, all the early Christians were all what? They were all Jews, they were all Jewish, right? But his kingdom, or a little kingdom, was still a huge possibility. If you go back and read Acts chapter 7, the very last thing that you see in the text is Jesus standing up. I've heard preachers say, oh, look at Jesus standing up to receive this great preacher who just preached this great message, and he's receiving Stephen. No, man, he was ready to come down. Anytime Jesus stands up in the Bible, he's ready, getting ready to return. He was getting ready to return. So what we can't lose sight of is this transition that's playing out. Unbeknownst to them, the Holy Spirit knew, but he tells them. He, that's why he says to the, the disciples in Acts chapter 1, go stay in Jerusalem, and at Pentecost, I'm going to do something crazy and something thing. Right? You know what he did? He empowered them with the Spirit of God. Right? They didn't know that the church was being birthed. How many of you had your salvation figured out when you got, first got saved? You didn't. Do you think little baby Cruz knows what life is really about right now? He has no concept. You know what? So are you at a, at a new birth. How much did you understand spiritual things? It took me literally months and years to sit in a room just like this, learning the Bible before things began to make sense. Hey, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. You know what the Bible revealed to me? It's more than that. It's about a relationship that I now have with the king of glory. That is the coolest thing ever. And they didn't have that figured out. They were still just a bunch of Jews running around waiting for a Jewish kingdom. That was what was playing out in the early part of the book of Acts. This is why you have to be careful and not take theology or doctrine from those transitional books, including the book of Hebrews. Yes, but again, it's, transi it's transitional because both, both kingdoms, right? When the spiritual kingdom came down with, at Pentecost, and they were empowered with the Holy Ghost, there's the kingdom of God. Remember, go back in your Bibles. Look at Acts chapter 1. Go back real quick, Acts chapter 1. Great questions. Look at how the book begins. The former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments, I'm sorry, he had given, yeah, he had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. The twelve, right? He's dealing with the twelve in the context of this passage, right? There's context. Now look at verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, right, by many infallible proofs, What's his passion? Whenever you find that term? The death, burial, and resurrection. Right? You guys remember, uh, what's his name? Mel Gibson, the passion of Christ. This is the story of the death, burial, and resurrection. So after his passion, he's still performing these incredible miracles. Watch this. Being seen of them for how long? For 40 days he's hanging out with them. For 40 days. And look what he's doing. And speaking of the things pertaining to what? The kingdom of God. There's an important phrase. You know what he's doing? He's revealing to them spiritual things. Spiritual things that I guarantee were just flying right over their heads. How do we know that? Keep reading because when you get to verse 6, they're saying to him, oh, wow, awesome, Lord. But when are you going to restore this kingdom? When are you going to set up your kingdom that you promised? You're going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. And then his response is amazing. It's incredible. Look at this. It's so profound. But ye shall receive power after that. No, verse 7. 
And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has given his, his hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come unto you, and ye shall be witnesses where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost, and the uttermost, and the uttermost part of the earth. He just told them right there that it's not for you to know. But here's what I do expect of you. I expect for you to be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost. Well, if you go back in verse number, um, look at verse 5. For John truly baptized with water. There's John's baptism. The same baptism that Peter is going to preach in Acts 2.38, by the way. John's baptism is not your baptism, by the way. You're baptized, why? Buried in the likeness of his death. Romans chapter 6. Raised in the likeness of his glory. Where do you find that baptism in scripture? Romans chapter what? Romans chapter 6. Go back to this chart and look where the book of Romans shows up. Who wrote the book of Romans? Paul. Paul ain't even saved in Acts chapter 1. When does Paul come to Christ? Acts chapter 9. Are you with me? Rightly divide the word of truth. So you can read all these phrases and all these words and all these stories. And you know what? If you f- and, and people do it all the time. Repent and be baptized, and they go and repent and be baptized for salvation. It's crazy. The religion that you grew up in teaches you that you need to be baptized in order to even think about going to heaven, believe it or not, right? You're dead now, and I hear it all the time at funerals, but because you were baptized as an infant, you're now Going to heaven. Oh, really? I don't even know. I had no idea who Jesus was at six months old. I didn't even know who my mom and dad were. All I knew was I could get milk from her. (laughs) Right? It's crazy how people think, man. Just read the text. Just let the Bible define itself. Let it interpret itself. So you get in here, and Jesus says this. Watch. Look at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. What was, what was, Jeru- was the significance of Jerusalem? It was all about the Jews. It was the place where God was, is going to ultimately set up his kingdom. Don't leave that place. Why? Because he wanted to give Israel one last chance. And I'm going to use you guys, you disciples, to do that. Look at this. For John truly baptized with water... But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times of the seasons, but the Father hath put him in his own power. Verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that, ye, after the Holy Ghost has come unto you, and then you shall be witnesses for me in those four places, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and what? The uttermost. The uttermost unbeknownst to them, he had you in mind. Santa Fe is the uttermost if you're sitting in Jerusalem. Seriously. I don't know where you were when you got saved, but he had you in mind when Jesus said, you're going to be my witness at the uttermost. You know where it happened for me in Kansas City, Missouri? He used an old preacher to preach a sermon out of Colossians chapter 4. And I went forward and I received Christ as Savior. I had no idea what it all meant. All I knew, man, that the Holy Spirit drew me in and revealed to me that I was a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. And I don't care how many sacraments I kept, I was never, never going to get there without His grace, without knowing and believing. When I started to open up this Bible and I found verses like, for there is none righteous, no one for all have sinned and come short of God's glory. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, but the but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Nobody ever told me how I was to experience eternal life. Although I'm an altar boy and I'm hearing phrases like eternal life and life forever. Not even Ponce de Leon figured it out. He's in Florida looking for the fountain of youth. Not even the Jehovah Witnesses have it figured out. Why? Michael Jackson, man, is trying to live forever in some oxygen tube 
It's crazy. Man has that desire to live forever, and that can only come because of what he did on that cross for you and for me. But they didn't know that because the kingdom, the literal Jewish kingdom on this earth was still a possibility until Acts chapter 7. And when Stephen got stoned, and I don't mean stoned like Santa Fe stoned, but when Stephen got stoned, God said, I'm done. And he shuts that door. And you know what you find in Acts chapter 8? New beginnings? Philip is up in northern Israel, hanging out with Tish, riding a camel in a place called Samaria. I say that because he was right. We were in the actual town. We were in the actual amphitheater where, where Philip was preaching to a bunch of Samaritans. Did you get, catch Jesus' words? From Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you're going to be witnesses where? In Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. You know who the Samaritans were? Half Jew, half Gentile. Descendants of the Assyrians and the Jews from their captivity. And you know what else he said? You know what else? And you, and you know what, and so he's up in Samaria. And he's preaching this amazing message, probably some Samaritans getting saved now, like you and I got saved. And the Holy Spirit of God taps him on his shoulder. He goes, you know what? There's this black man from Ethiopia on his way home from Jerusalem who was worshiping the God of Israel at the temple. And he stops in Gaza to rest. And as he stops to rest, he opens up his Bible to Isaiah chapter 53, and he's reading a passage about this Messiah or about this person who had been led to a slaughter and he was going to die like a sheep being led to slaughter. That's what he's reading in Acts chapter number 8. And then Philip shows up out of, the, out of nowhere. If you look at a map, he's probably two and a half hours from Samaria to Gaza. What is the Gaza Strip today? And this guy's going home, mind you. Talk about a man with a good heart. How do you know he's a good heart? Man, he had just he's going back to Africa after worshiping the God of the Jews at the temple in Jerusalem. All he had was his Old Testament. And God in his plan and in his infinite wisdom says, I need you to share Jesus with him. As a matter of fact, when Philip shows up, he asks Philip, he goes, who's the prophet writing about you or some other man? And at that instant, at that point, the Bible says that Philip preached unto him Jesus. And he says, I believe in this Jesus. I believe in Jesus with all my heart. And in the very next verse, in the very next passage, he gets baptized. But he got baptized not for salvation. He got baptized because of verse number 37, because he believed in his heart the Lord Jesus. And he accepted Jesus. So he got baptized, he received Jesus Christ, and in verse 38, he gets baptized. You want to hear something crazy? Turn to any text except this one, and verse 37 is left completely out. Completely out. It's not even in your Bible. What's the notion? What's the, what's the idea here? No? You got to get saved. You got to get baptized to be saved. You gotta get the baptized to be saved. Look at throw verse 37 up there, David. Look at verse 37. This verse is non-existent in all modern translations. And Philip's then Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And in the very next verse he gets baptized. So when we baptize people, very first thing I ask him is I confirm that they're saved. If not, we're just dunking them, man. They're going down. What they're wet sinners, and they're gonna no. They're gonna go down, dry, dry, dried lost people, and they're gonna come out wet lost people. Because of that verse or the previous verse is the key to why we baptize. As Nacho Libro say, as we baptize, right? They baptize. So they could win a wrestling match. We baptize because we believe in what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. 
And then what happens next in Acts chapter 9? Paul shows up. Then in Acts chapter 10, a Roman soldier in Caesarea Maritima shows up, a huge naval base that the Romans had in near, just south of Tel Aviv. And he comes to Christ. Cornelius, the Roman centurion. And you want to hear something really cool? Now these guys are making their way up, not to Jerusalem anymore, but now they're in Turkey. Now they're in Asia Minor, a city called Antioch. And in Acts chapter 11, I think it's verse 25, maybe 26, and mark this, mark this term, principle of first mention. The Bible says they were first called Christians at Antioch. First time the word Christian shows up in the Bible. Not in Matthew, not in, Act, not in, not in Mark, not in Luke, not in John, but in Acts chapter 11, verse 35, 25. Somebody tell me where it is. And they were, they were first called Christians Can you, 26, David, check this out. Not in Jerusalem, not in Haifa, but in Antioch. And Antioch becomes the Jerusalem. What Jerusalem was to the Jews, Antioch becomes to the Gentile church. It becomes the base. This is what... Exactly. You got it. Good point. The transition is complete. What might have still been happening, they were probably still meeting on Saturdays. And that's cool. God's cool with it. God's not going to strike you dead because you want to watch cartoons and then go to church. No, man. It's grace. It's God. And then in Acts chapter 12, another significant event happens. Anybody know what happens in Acts chapter 12? James gets martyred. The first martyr is James. And you know what's interesting about Acts chapter 12? You don't see anybody rushing to replace him like you find in Acts chapter 1 when they were scurrying around to replace Judas Iscariot with Matthias. Why? God was done with Israel thing, the whole Israel thing. The 12 dudes that are going to judge the 12 tribes Matthew 19, are already in place. Matthew, Matthias replaced Judas. The Bible's not hard, huh? It's really not. It's really not. And then from that point on, God's kicking the door wide open, man. And this is where page 8 is really handy because now you see where God and where Paul is showing up, man. And this Apostle Paul dude, man, he just shows up and he's rocking the world. And then some 2,000 years later, God in his infinite plan and in his infinite wisdom, he says, we're going to put a church in Santa Fe that loves, that loves me, that loves my word, that will rightly divide my, truth, my word. And here we are. You're the uttermost. You are the uttermost. And it's past nine. Context. We have a question, Larry, from somebody online. It's a comment from somebody online. Okay, go ahead. We have a question so, from somebody online. So go this ahead. is from Jared, uh, from JC, Tisha's JC. son. I and wonder who says, that is. He says, "Before the video feed turns off, I just want to take a quick second to thank each and every one of you awesome. that has been praying for me." some of whom I've never met yet that hasn't stopped you from blessing me with your fervent prayers, Amen. which has truly touched my heart and lifted my spirits. I feel them working, and I feel God's healing hand touching my body. Oh, God bless God. you all. Praise God. Amen. 
Um, for those of you that may not know who Jared is or JC, it's Tish's and Bob Lee's son. So we pr- continue to pray. He's at um, UNM right now um, getting some tests done and stuff. So God's good, man. He's so good. And uh, so next week, we're going to stay with these principles. Context, context, context. Are you guys seeing it? Right? So start intertwining these things. So next week, we're going to look at the Jew-Gentile church thing. We're going to go all the way back to the book of Genesis and show you where everything originates um, in terms of the term, the principle of first mention, where the word Gentile shows up for the first time, where Israel shows up for the first time in the, in the Bible so that you know and how God is working throughout the next um, the next phase of our study, which is going to be the timeline stuff, okay? Are we good? Um, context, context, context. All right. Thank you, Lord, for our time together tonight, for your word, for your goodness, your love for us. And um, Lord, we just want to take a minute and just, uh, Lord, continue to ask and pray on behalf of uh, our little brother, JC, and just continue, Lord Jesus, to, to heal like only you can heal. And Lord, I pray for the comfort and the peace that Kaylee and the boys need, Lord, in this time away as their, uh, as their husband and father are away. Just pray, Lord, that you continue to, to work, Lord Jesus, in all our lives and um, bring us back together this Sunday, Lord, and the men on Saturday, Lord, as we gather to, to consider some principles out of Second Timothy um, for, for, for on leadership and, and what it means to be a godly man, Lord. Be with us now, and Lord Jesus, we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.